The crime of the Antichrist. Now we've dealt with some of these issues already yesterday, but perhaps we just want to put one or two things into perspective and see where we're heading. Before I do that, what is a beast in the Bible? It's a political entity. Now we find the beast in Revelation as well, and uh, we find that beast in Revelation 13, and it rises up out of the sea amongst the nations, and then it has all the attributes of the little horn. All the attributes of the little horn. And we'll deal with that prophecy in detail, I think it is, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. And somebody asked me earlier, is America in prophecy? Well, come and listen tomorrow night. And let's have a look at what the Bible says, and then you decide for yourself if it's in there or whether it's not in there. I mean, this is, this is a thunderous time that we're living in. Now, you know, if something walks like a duck, and it looks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck, right? So if, if something has exactly the same attributes as the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, then what is the probability that it is the little horn in Daniel chapter 7? Pretty good, right? Okay. So this power we'll be dealing with tomorrow night, and there's just so much to deal with, you cannot open it up all in one evening. But uh, let's have a look at this little horn power and look at some of the aspects of what it did. The little horn power in Daniel 7.25 we saw last night would think to change times and laws. Of course he says that he can change times and laws, he can change the times, he can change God's law, but in actual fact he only presumes to. He is presumptuous. Nobody can change God's law and get away with it. Would you agree? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For now there's a reason. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Now what does the evolution theory do that text? Was it in the waste paper basket? How many lectures did we spend here saying that you cannot throw that text into the waste paper basket? Was it for? I think so. You cannot throw that in the waste paper basket. Now why so much effort to throw that piece in the waste paper basket? Because if that piece is not in the waste paper basket then you're in trouble with this one. The sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 28 to 11. That means he set it aside for holy use. Now man was created male and female, representing communication on the horizontal level. He was to be confederate. But without God in the equation, you have what you have today. Total chaos. Not only in marriage, but in general. You have to have God in the equation. This is quite an interesting story. When I first came into contact with God, I was actually quite jealous of Him. Because He requires first place. And I was married to my wife, and she was all mine. And now I had to share her. That was tough. I, I, I walked around with a lip this long for quite a while while I was muddling this over. Maybe I'm just a bit weird, but I was thinking about these things. Now, eventually, when I started realizing the character of God and His total selfishness, if someone is 100% selfless, like Jesus was, he poured himself out for mankind. If he's 100% selfish, then how much are you going to get out of the deal if you are dealing with such an individual? You're going to get 100%. And that's the beauty of it. You see, if you love God supremely, you get God's love supremely, unselfishly, 
poured out upon you and the blessing becomes so great that the relationship between a man and a woman gets increased in relationship glory, whatever you want to call it, millions of times. It gets enhanced because God is in the equation. In fact, God can set so many of our selfish rituals straight. How many people are linked to each other by selfish ties? That the one may not do this or that or the other because the other one restrains him. Now if you have the Spirit of God in you, you become selfless and your whole view changes and you want to make the other one more happy by giving more and more freedom. And of course that is dangerous in the eyes of the world because freedom means you can do what you want to. So it's a question of choice. So if you are making your choices within the realms of what God has defined as right and good, then the relationship can blossom. It's absolutely amazing. So here God says that you must keep the Sabbath day for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he's, he's the creator. He's the one that brought it all about. And he rested on the seventh day. He rested. Was God tired? No, God wasn't tired. So what is this rest that he found in his relationship with man? He rested because in man he found the fulfillment of his whole plan for the entire universe. His whole plan. In man was to be made manifest the glory of God. He created man for his own glory, says the Bible. In other words, man was to reflect to the universe the glory and the wisdom of God. It's a noble, noble purpose. Tremendous thoughts. So here, God looked at this new creation of His and He found rest in it. It's, it's like when you have a new relationship. You've met this woman of your dreams or if you are of the opposite sex, this man of your dreams. And you've been separated for a while and now you come together again for the first time and you look at each other and you hold each other and you have nothing to say except uh, rest. To find rest in the relationship. Does that make any sense? So God rested. He found peace in the relationship. Even though he knew that war was going to break out all around him as a consequence. Because the devil was angry when he created man. He was angry. But God found rest in man. And man can find rest in God in spite of what's going on around us. So he rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you know that two lovers that really love each other can find rest in each other even if the whole world is going up in smoke around them? Did you know that? Absolutely. So we can only find rest in God. So God took this Sabbath day and set it aside for a holy purpose. He said to man, you go and have dominion. You go and do whatever you want to do. You place the world under you. Put it into subjection. Change it. Modify it. Do whatever you like. But once a week, let's come and have holy communion together. We will talk every day. We will walk together every day. We will commune every day. But let's set a day aside. That's what it is all about. Exodus 20, 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all this in them, and He rested. And the Hebrew word used there is Noach, whereas previously it was Shabbat, the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and He hallowed it. And this Noach, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, means to rest, to settle down, it means to be confederate. It's like I've been explaining, to be together. To have this feeling that, wow, this is great. We belong together. Moreover, 
Also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. This holy relationship, this capacity to do what is right, this will to do what is right, comes from God. And so the Lord gave the Sabbath as a sign between them that they may know that He, the Lord, is the one that sanctifies them. Ex Ezekiel 20 verse 12 and 20. So and here's another parallel text. And hallow my Sabbaths. Hallow them. And they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. This is weird. Is it possible that somebody else could be the Lord your God? Yes or no? Yes, well, many people, the ancient folks, even the Israelites, constantly strayed and bowed down to another deity. Whoever he was, whether he was Moloch, or whether he was Baal, or whether he was whatever, or they worshipped Ashtoreth, the Queen of Heaven. All these strange deities. God says, no, 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 listen here. I make a pact with you. Hello, my Sabbath, and it shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. It's like a test. It's like a test. Exodus 31 verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Not another. I am the one. Exodus 31, 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. For a perpetual covenant. Now let's have a look at this sign. It is a sign, <coughs> Hebrews, the word there is oath, between me and the children of Israel forever. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh day, and he was refreshed. Nafash. Very interesting verse this. So it is a sign. And why? Because God is your creator. He's your owner. He says there, choose me. I am the one who made you. All the others didn't make you. They're just stealing you and offering you nothing in return but death. So it is a sign, and God was refreshed. Now what does that word sign mean? Well, if you look up the Hebrew again, and it says it is a token, it is an ensign, it is a miracle, if you like, and it is a mark, it is a standard, it is a mark, a signal, a distinguishing mark. That's the Strong's Concordance definition of the word. So does God have a mark? Yes. What is it? Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. God has a mark. Does the beast have a mark? Yeah, it's called the mark of the beast. I wonder what that is. Is it a computer in Brussels? Is it a barcode that will be chapped onto your hand? Is it something that you find on a can of beans? If you look at the bottom? Is God interested in lines on a can of beans? Or is He interested in your character and in your allegiance? What is he interested in? In your character and in your allegiance. So let's have a look at this very carefully. All right. So we've now established that God has a mark, a sign, and it is the Sabbath. So it is a mark or a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested, and he was refreshed. So we must understand God's mark, His sign, or His seal. These are synonyms. Let's have a look at the seal of the United States. Seeing that we are in the United States, a seal authenticates a document. This is the seal of the President of the United States of America. And this was a typical royal seal. This was the seal of George VI, Regent King of England, note the three elements. It gives his name, George VI, and it gives his title, which is King, and it gives his territory, which is Great Britain and the Dominions. 
So a typical seal has all those components, the title, and it has the name, and it has the territory. And without it, a law would be useless. It would have no authority. Now the Decalogue is a law. It is the law of God. Now this whole law has its authority only because it has a seal in it. God's seal is in the heart of God's law. Let's listen to this carefully. All the other commandments are just commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not have another God besides me, thou shalt not use the name in vain, honor your parents and, your, and you will have a long life, etc. But here there's something special. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, for in six days the Lord, there's the name, that's Yahweh, that's God's name, we have a name. He made the heavens and the earth, so that is the title, he's the creator. And what is the dominion? Heaven, earth, sea, all that is in them. So there you have the dominion. All the elements are there. And without the Sabbath, the law would have no authenticity. It would be just another document. But now it has the stamp of God. Yahweh, your creator, dominion, heaven, earth, sea, everything, every nation, everything that was ever created is under my dominion. Now, if the United States makes a law, a new law, and proclaims a new law, then that law must be signed by whom before it comes into effect? The president. The president must sign it. And if the president doesn't sign it, the law is not valid. Is that right? All right. Now imagine, I always use a parable to explain this. Imagine we place ourselves back sometime there in the times of Germany. And Adolf Hitler comes to power and he's so impressed with his power he wants to make sure that there is no opposition. So he proclaims a law. It's just a hypothetical story, it's a nonsense story, but it's just there to illustrate a point. He proclaims a law and he says, next Wednesday, 12 o'clock, I want the German people to come onto the streets and proclaim their solidarity for me by one voice shouting Heil Hitler on that particular day, on Wednesday at whatever time, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, let's say 12 o'clock, everybody has to do it. And the Gestapo is out and the military police is out and the parades are full. How many of the German people would have appeared on the street that day? Just about everybody. And there they go, and when the clock strikes, they all show their solidarity. Now, I was so impressed with that that I make a law, and I say, no, 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 no. Next Thursday at 12 o'clock, everybody has to come onto the street and shout, Heil Walter Feit. Send that out to everyone in Germany. Next Thursday comes around, how many people appear on the streets? No. Not one single sausage. That's not fair. Why not? Why they do it for that bozo but not for me? What's the difference? I don't have the authority, I don't have the title, I don't have the jurisdiction. Does that make sense? So his counts, mine counts for nothing. Mine counts for nothing. I have the same law but it means nothing. Well, Adolf Hitler got so excited when he got such a positive response. It never happened, by the way. But he decides to write the same law and he sends it, let's say, to Russia. And says, next Wednesday, 12 o'clock, I want the Russian people on the roads and shouting the same thing. How many Russians would appear on the streets? <laughs> Not one. Maybe they would appear to mock him. What's the difference? Why did it work in Germany and not in Russia? He didn't, he didn't have the jurisdiction. He might have had a title, and he might have had all those things, but he didn't have the jurisdiction. So here we have all of these in one shot. The Lord, that's his name, 
we have the jurisdiction, we have the title, the creator, and we have the jurisdiction which includes everything on earth and in heaven. So everybody has to obey him. This makes the law authentic and gives power to the whole of the law. Without the Sabbath, without that signature, the whole law becomes just another document with rules. Not saying where it comes from, not saying who has the authority. So the Lord, the Creator, heaven and earth, that is what authenticates the whole law. Everybody understand that? Without it, the law is not authenticated. So this seal contains his name, his title, and his territory. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So now, how do I show God that I am willing to obey Him? Do I put up a big banner? Do I wear a certain dress? Do I put a certain hat on my head? Do I do whatever or do I just obey Him and keep that day because He said so? Isn't that the greatest sign of all? If you just do it because He said so? Wow! That's fantastic. Now what if somebody else comes along and says, now hang on a second, hang on a second, what's going on here? Who do you think you are obeying that precept and giving your allegiance to that power? I'm telling you, I don't want you to obey them, I want you to obey me. And I'm telling you, let's change this. Let's check who has authority in your life. Is it God? Or is it me? And I'm telling you, you better obey me rather than God. Would you have a problem? Yeah. Sure you'd have a problem. I always use another parable, parable, parable. I always tell the story of, let's say for example, again this is totally hypothetical, right? It's a nice parable, I always use it, and everybody always misunderstands it and they think it's really true, but it's not true, it's just a parable. Assume I'm married to my wife many years and I have children and then one day some other bozo comes along is that an acceptable word in this country? I don't know. He comes along and he gets my wife to follow him and she leaves me and moves in with this other guy, marries him and takes the kids with him. Now I'm devastated, devastated. There she is with this other guy. And why she wants to choose this guy with the cauliflower ears and the buck teeth in the first place, I don't know, but she's off with him and she's left me. And now, I had certain rules in my house. Let's say the kids have to be in bed at a certain time or they have to do their homework or they have to help in the house and they're not allowed to watch bad stuff on television and if they go out they have to be back at a reasonable time. Stuff like that, normal stuff. And this new guy says to the kids when they move in, listen, in this house, I'm the authority in your lives, as far as this house is concerned, and I want you to keep your, you know, live tidily and help in the house and not to be too late when you come home and, and uh, you know, all the good things that I had as well. Would I have a problem with any of those rules that he made, yes or no? I would have no problem with them whatsoever. But then he has one extra rule, and he says to my kids, listen, I have one extra rule. Your dad has a th had authority over you in the past. Your dad had authority over you in the past. But that is over. I am the new authority in your life and you will obey me. And the kids say, hang on a second, we have visitation times with my dad on certain days he only has that particular day which he has specified, because it's the right one or whatever, and this guy says, no way, you will listen to me, no longer to your dad. Would I have a problem with that rule? Yes. Yeah, I'd probably go around and modify his nose by turning it around 360 degrees, right? <laughs> now why does that rule irritate me? Because it affects my authority. Nobody messes with my authority when it comes to my kids. They're my kids too. They're my kids too. Now God feels the same way. We are His kids. And another power comes along and says, I don't care about these other rules, but this particular one, the one that tests authority, you will obey me and not God. Hey, 
God says, I'll turn your nose around 360 degrees, whether you like it or not. And he will. And he will. It's going to happen. <laughs> so God says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Isaiah 58, 13 says, If you turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. I'm not talking about the way the Jews kept the Sabbath. A ritual where you do this and you're not allowed to do that and you're not allowed to eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath and you're not allowed to do this, that and the other, walk so many yards or whatever. No, 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 that's a burden. It says here, you call the Sabbath a delight, not the burden. The holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, and not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the, of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He says, if you honor my authority in your life, and you spend it with me, and you allow me to sanctify you, you will, you will be happy and you will have the heritage of Jacob, which is eternal life. And what about the strangers? Did it apply only to the Jews this Sabbath day? Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. All the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord, to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath. The Sabbath became the sign of your allegiance to the deity called Yahweh. It was the sign. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So if a stranger came, did he have to accept the Sabbath, yes or no? Yes. Sure, he had to accept the Sabbath. Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 20, and it will be for you if you will listen carefully to my commandments, which I command you today, take heed to yourselves that your heart may not be deceived. The commandments are the law. They're rigid. You cannot change them. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. So is there a possibility that this conflict could arise? Yes or no? Certainly could. Therefore, now listen carefully. You shall lay up these my words in your hearts, talking about the commandments of God, and in your souls, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, listen carefully now, on your hand, so that they may, may be as frontlets between your eyes. So where must the commandments of God be placed? On your hand and in your forehead. Wow! Is there a mark of a beast that must be placed on the hand or the forehead? Yes or no? Oh! But the commandments of God must be on your hand on your forehead. Now the Jews were very clever. They wrote out the Ten Commandments on a little plaque and stuck them on the hand and stuck them on the forehead and therefore the deed was done. I've got the law in my hand, I've got the law in my forest. Big deal. Do you think that's what God had in mind? That would be so silly, it would be unbelievable. God never had that in mind. What did He have in mind when He said that? He said, tie them to your hand, act accordingly. Put them in there, think accordingly. Doesn't that make sense? It's got nothing to do with an outward sign. God is not silly. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your hearts. That's where he wanted them. I wonder whether they cut it open over here and put the plaque inside there as well. No, they didn't. And you shall carefully teach them to your sons, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes here in your cognitive thinking. This is God's law. I will keep God's law. He is my God. I will follow Him. That's what it says. Continue in Exodus chapter 13 verse 9, It shall be a sign unto them upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. It's pretty clear. What must be on the forehead and on the hand? The law of God. It's got nothing to do with a barcode from a can of beans or whatever. 
It's got to do with the law of God that has to be on your hand and that has to be in your forehead. Now what about that other guy with the cauliflower ears and the buck teeth who takes away the followers of God? Actually he doesn't have cauliflower ears and buck teeth. He's actually quite handsome. It's quite irritating. But in any case, takes them away and misleads them. Misleads them. And he says, no, 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 no. My sign, my mark on your forehead or your hand. Well, let's have a look. What was the purpose then of the Sabbath? It was a day of rest. It was a day of blessing. It was a day of peace. It was a sign. It was a memorial to creation. It was a symbol of sanctification. It was a hallowed day. And it was a perpetual covenant. That was what there was. And remember Mark 2 verse 27? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That doesn't get rid of the Sabbath. It just tells you that man needs the Sabbath. Man needs this communication with his God and he must know who his God is. The God that we serve is the God of the Sabbath. That's the God whom we serve. Otherwise, who is he? Is it the one of the Friday? Is it the one of the Sunday? Is it the one of the Wednesday? Is it a God of the Hindus? Is it the one of Buddhists? Is it the one of the Shintus? Is it this one? Is it that one? I'll tell you what, it's the God of the Sabbath. Simple as that. So the Bible says. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened unto my commandments, then thou had peace, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Isaiah 48, 18. You would know exactly where you stand, or where you are. Deuteronomy 5, 29. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. Nine of them or all of them? All my commandments. Always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Well, having established that, then why do we keep Sunday? Why don't we keep the Sabbath? Why does the Christian world keep Sunday? Sunday. Let's ask Webster's International Dictionary what it means. Some of the new dictionaries, dictionaries get quite sneaky. You've got to watch it. In the old days, they used to define it like this. So-called because this day was anciently dedicated to the sun or its worship. Chef's Encyclopedia says, Sunday, dear solace of the Roman calendar, day of the sun being dedicated to the sun, the first day of the week. Most Oxford dictionaries will say Sunday, first day of the week. New Oxford dictionaries will say Sunday, day following Saturday. That's pathetic. That's not a definition anymore. That's a definition in terms of another definition. It doesn't mean anything anymore. But there you have it. That's what it is. It's the day of the sun. It's dear solace of the Roman Canada. The day of the sun and it's the first day of the week. It's not the seventh day of the week. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. John E.D. Didi, a Bible cyclopedia, page 561. You can check it out. I mean, it's all there. The reference are there. Take your ordinary dictionary at home and see what that says. So the Sabbath is not Sunday, it's Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. But the Christian world keeps Sunday. Let's have a look at a, at a photocopy, if you like. A photograph of a, of a dictionary. Seventh day, Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Daniel 7 verse 25, remember, said, And he, the little horn, we identified him last night, shall speak words against the Most High, shall work, work, wear out the saints of the Most High, and plot to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a half a time. Now, Revelation 13 verse 7 talks about this beast that has all the attributes of the little horn, and we've already said if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. So this beast is exactly the same power as the little horn power and we are told that this beast will implement with the aid of another power which we will deal with tomorrow night 
the mark of this beast. Now we've already established what God's mark was. What was it? The Sabbath. And where was it to be written? On the forehead and on the hand. Now, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Revelation 13, 7. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Fascinating text. Fascinating text. We will deal with this in detail and take it apart. Every aspect of that text we will open up. One little difference between God's mark and the beast marks. And it's just a tiny little difference. It lies over here. It says, All, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. God's was to be in the right hand and in the forehead. God is not satisfied with halfway service. All or nothing. This beast is happy if you have it in your forehead. That is, you think it's right and you act accordingly. But he's also happy if you don't think it's right, if you go along with it because you have no other choice. So act accordingly because he said so, then he also will leave you alone. Does that make sense? As long as you obey him. He doesn't care how, whether you're convinced or not as long as you obey him. Wow. And if you don't do it, economic boycott. You will not be able to buy or sell. We'll freeze your bank account. We'll freeze it. And save that you have this mark, or the name of the beast, which stands for its character, or the number, and we'll be dealing with that as well. Now let's have a look at the Roman Decretalia. Now this comes from a Roman Catholic source, Decretal de Translat Episcop. He, the Pope, can pronounce sentences and judgments in contradictions to the rights of nations, to the law of God and man. He's a mighty man. He's mightier than God or any nation on earth. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. He can do whatever he likes. We read further. The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So no matter what the old husband said, I'm the new husband around here, you won't listen to your previous dad, you'll listen to me. Have we got this other guy around, yes or no? Yes. We have him around, there he is. Let's see what he says, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, 4 Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, which is transgressing of the law, will be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God. He's the other guy. And his day is coming when his nose will be twisted 360 degrees, not by me or by any man, but by God. Without human hands, the Bible says. Pope Nicholas quoted in Facts for the Time, Pope, the Pope's will stands for reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. He's a powerful guy. He can do whatever he likes. Ask the Catholic Church, which is the Sabbath day? It says Saturday is the Sabbath day. Your dad said keep Saturday. But I'm telling you, no visitation on that day. Then why do you observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Why? Because I'm the new authority in your life, and we observe Sunday instead of Saturday, because we, the Catholic Church, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This is not just any source. This is the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1957. That's pretty straight, out of the horse's mouth. This is the new boyfriend. And he says, you will not listen to your dad, you'll listen to me, because I said so. So what is he attacking? Isn't he attacking the authority of God? You cannot attack the authority of God, of God on the strength of any other commandment except the Sabbath. You can only attack the authority of God on the strength of the Sabbath, because that is what determines the authority. 
So what is the mark of the beast then? We have a beast. We have a beast that says, you will accept my mark, and you will have it on your hand or your forehead. We have a seal of God, which is a mark, which says, you will keep the commandments of God on your hands and on your foreheads. Whoa, we're coming to an impasse. There's no compromise here. What does the beast say? What is its mark? This is the Catholic record, September 1, 1923, they say. Sunday is our mark of authority. So what is the mark of the beast then? What does it say? It says Sunday. The church is above the Bible. Wow, I'm the new boyfriend. You don't listen to the rules of your dad. You listen to me. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic record, there they say it. So we have two marks on this earth, and the choice is ours. Either we obey God, or we obey the new boyfriend. That's it. So Satan has attacked the Sabbath because it is the seal of God. It affects the authority of God. Let's have some more quotes. Catholic World, March 1894. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, that's Baal, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus. Interesting. Let's take another one. Faith of our fathers, Cardinal Gibbons. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act, and he reiterates it, is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. She says she's mightier than God in this issue. I don't care what laws God made, you will listen to me. This is real arrogance. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. They're pretty straight. Who's this speaking? Oh, it's Father Enright, writing in the American Sentinel. This is the Catholic Church spokesman. He says, the Bible says so, but the Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Isn't that arrogance beyond measure? It is so arrogant, freaks me out. By my divine power? Well, if that's their divine power, then it must be a different divine power to God's divine power, right or wrong. There's another God on earth who sets himself up in the temple of God, claiming to be God. So we have two that we are serving. Of course, the Catholic Church is not really God. It must have another power behind it. And the Bible says, And the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. Those are very sad words, and I don't say them flippantly. Catechismus Romanus, Pope Pius 1566, commanded by the Council of Trent, it pleased the Church of God that the religious celebration of the Sabbath day should be transferred to the Lord's Day, Sunday. Over and over, they say, I was in a spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1.10. They say, well, the Lord's Day was Sunday. It doesn't say so. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. It doesn't say what day it was. Only the Bible can say which is the Lord's Day. And there it is, Isaiah 58.13. If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord. So which is the Lord's Day according to the Bible? The Sabbath, not Sunday. So I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. It doesn't really cut any ice. What about this one? Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Does that do away with the Sabbath or establish who is in authority when it comes to the Sabbath? By the way, who created this world? Jesus. Was it the Father or was it through the Son? Through the Son. It was through the Son. You go and read. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything that was created on this world was created through Him and for Him. By His Word it stands. So Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Catholic Press, Sydney, August 25, 1900. Sunday is a Catholic institution, and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. These are all Catholic quotes.
From the beginning to the end of scriptures, there is not a single passage which warrants the transfer of the weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. They are so straightforward on this. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. James Gardner Kibbins, the faith of our fathers. The Catholic Church is throwing out the gauntlet and saying, "Dead, Take it or leave it. Choose. The Christian Sabbath is to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. Catholic Mirror, September 23. So they say to the Protestants, you say you're Protestants? Why you obey us then? If you obey us, then you're ours, whether you like it or not. They're so arrogant. Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore replying for the Cardinal in a letter dated 19, uh, February 10, 1920, if Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. This is the Catholic Church speaking. John Gibney Shea, American Catholic Quarterly Review, Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Church has no good reason for, for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. Not the Creator, this is really arrogant. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 2, and 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. This is so arrogant, it blows my mind. This is unbelievable, and this one was made not in the Middle Ages, this was made in 1969. Reason and common sense demand, then this one should really clinch it. Re reason and common sense demand acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. There you go. Catholic Mirror, December 23, 1893. There's the battle line. If you obey God, you keep which day? Saturday. Saturday. If you obey the Catholic Church, you keep Sunday. That's what they're saying. So if you're a Protestant, but you're keeping Sunday, you're really obeying whom? You're obeying the Pope. That doesn't mean that Protestants out there who have never heard this information now have the mark of the beast. They don't. Because God is judging them according to the light that they have. But this issue is going to become prominent very very soon because the present Pope the present Pope has asked for worldwide Sunday legislation and your president had said we want to implement his teachings that's interesting I'll show it to you still I'll show it to you so now why do Protestants keep on keeping Sunday well what do they say do they know this or don't they know this yes they know it yes they know it Let's have it run through them quickly. The Episcopals say, Is there any commandment in the New Testament to change the day of weekly rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. Manual of Christian Doctrine. That's, well, that's their, their big writing. We have made a change from seventh day to the first day from Saturday to Sunday on the authority of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Christ. Why we keep Sunday? That's the Episcopal Church. Well, they're so near to the Catholics, it's, you know, it's just sort of a, a hiccup between them. But they say, they know, but they keep Sunday. All right. What about the other Protestant groups? The Lutheran Church. We observe the Lord's Day, Sunday, is founded, or the observance of the Lord's Day, Sunday, is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the Church. This is the Augsburg Confession. This is the central document for Lutheranism in the Catholic Sabbath Manual, Part 2, Section 1. They know it. All right. What about the Presbyterians? A change of the day to be observed from the last day of the week to the first. There is no record, no express command authorizing the change. This is the Christian Chabot, Sabbath in L. Rice, one of their spokespersons. Fine. What about the Methodists? Take the matter of Sunday. There is no passage telling Christians to keep that day or to transfer the Jewish Sabbath to that day. Christian Advocate, July 2, 1942. So the Methodists know it. Well, what's going on here? What about the Congregationalists? It's quite clear that however rigidly or devoutly we spend Sunday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. 
There's not a single sentence in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating the supposed sanctity of Sunday. This is the Ten Commandments by Dr. Dale. All right, that's the Congregationalists. Is there anybody out there? Hello, Anglicans? Many people think that Sunday is the Sabbath. But neither in the New Testament nor in the early church is there anything to suggest that we have any right to transfer the observance of the seventh day of the week to the first. The Sabbath was an East Saturday, not Sunday. Reverend Lionel Beer, Church of the People. There we go. Well, what about the Baptists? There was an easy commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath was not Sunday. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Is this anybody speaking? Oh no, this is Hicks Hiscox. He's the author of the Baptist manual. He should know. So they all know. Every single one of them knows. Here's another one. Reverend Philip Carrington, Anglican Bishop, Quebec. He sent them all in a scurry saying outright that there was nothing to support Sunday being kept holy. He definitely told the church meeting in the city of straight-laced Protestantism that tradition, not the Bible, had made Sunday the day of worship, Toronto Daily Star. So tradition, pagan tradition, introduced by Rome, kept it. Now what does the Lord say about tradition? Well, let's read that. Almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week. Yet the Christians, and now note this, of Alexandria, and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. This is ecclesiastical history. Now Alexandria is the one where all the pagan doctrines were introduced. This is where the Sadducees learned that there was no resurrection. But that when you go to heaven, you go and sit on Abraham's lap. And Jesus said, hey, what are you teaching there? There's no such thing. So Alexandria and Rome are the seat of paganism. Alexandria taught ancient Egyptian Gnostic mysteries and based on Kabbalism and Gnosticism. Ancient tradition. Well, Catholic record says Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and is a distinctly Catholic institution. We will deal with that in some astounding detail what paganism has done and how occultism has controlled some of these decisions. The New Testament makes no explicit mention that the Apostle changed the day of worship, but we know it from tradition. This is the revised Baltimore Catechism. So these are the authoritative documents of the church. It's all based on tradition. And the Bible says, Matthew 15, 3, 6, and 9, He answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And you voided the commandments of God by your tradition, but in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Can you do it? Yes or no? No, you can't. You cannot substitute tradition for obedience. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Mark 7 and 9. So the Bible says one thing, the Rome says another, and here we have a basis for conflict. And this basis for conflict is going to rise like a mushroom and it's going to come to a head very, very soon. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound by the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. Canon and Tradition, page 263. That's it. That's the choice. Whether we like it or whether we don't. Acts 20 says, For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves come in and change the doctrines. All right. If you go to your churches and you ask them, why do we keep Sunday? Then there is a scurry and a flurry. And then there will be some scriptural evidence brought forward, although all the authoritative writers have said there is no scriptural authority for the transfer. 
Yet they will tell you, there are texts in the Bible which said that they worshipped on the first day of the week and therefore we worship on the first day of the week. Or they will say that Jesus abolished the Sabbath and nailed it to the cross and we no longer keep it. Therefore let no one judge you as to a Sabbath day, quoting Colossians and all those texts. Or they will say to you, how do we know what the Sabbath is? You know there's been so much time and then it really doesn't matter, observe any day. What day did God say you must observe? The Sabbath day. Imagine you have a rendezvous with your loved one that you haven't seen for a long time and she says, Wednesday morning 7 o'clock I arrive. Please pick me up at the station. And you think, okay, that's alright, I love her, I'll go on Thursday. Do you think she'll be happy? I kind of doubt it. Alright, thank you. The first day of the week, let's have a look at these texts that are used to substantiate Sunday observance. The first text we find in Matthew 28 verse 1. It says, there are eight texts about the first day of the week that are used. The first one says, in the end of the Sabbath it became, began to dawn towards the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre and that's it. Is there anything about a change of the Sabbath, yes or no? It's a purely historic statement. The New English Bible says the Sabbath had passed and it was daybreak on Sunday when Mary so and so and so and so. So it's a purely factual statement, there's nothing in it. Alright, we can discard it. Luke 23, 54, 56 by the way tells us that these women, they kept the Sabbath, they prepared spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So they knew nothing about a change. When these women came on the first day, it's because they didn't go on the Sabbath day because they rested according to the commandment. Alright, the second text we find in Mark chapter 16, 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought spices that they might come and anoint them very early in the morning. On the first day of the week they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Anything about a change there? Not a word. Alright, third text, Mark 16, 9. When Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Anything there about a change? Or is it just a statement of fact? Statement of fact, nothing there about a change. We can discard that one. Fourth text. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulchre bringing the spices. So that's in Luke, it's the other gospel, he repeats the story. Anything about a change? Nothing. So we can discard that one. We've only got four left that we have to deal with. Fifth one, John 20 verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark into the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Anything there? Nothing. That leaves us with three. Six texts. John 20 verse 19. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and says unto them Peace be unto you. This one is used quite often. Aha! The disciples came together on the first day of the week, they were worshipping. Doesn't say so. It says they came together on the first day of the week for what? Fear, Fear of the Jews. You see on the Sabbath they knew they were relatively safe because no Jew would do anything. He would think he would be breaking the Sabbath. But when the Sabbath was over, they were quaking in their boots. So it says nothing about worship. That leaves two texts. Two texts, and these are the hot ones. Acts 20 verse 7 And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now the New English Bible says on Saturday night they came together. Ah, they say, well here's the text which says that they worshipped on the Sabbath day and they had communion, they broke bread. Now let's analyze the text carefully. On the first day of the week they came together to break bread. When does the first day start? At the end of the Sabbath, what time of day was that? It was in the evening. So they came together when the first day of the week came, it was evening and they came to break bread. Alright, so that's one text we have to look at. They came to break bread, but Paul preached to them ready to depart on the morrow. So when the light should dawn, it would still be which day? 
Sunday the first day and he was going to go a long long way and he talked to them until midnight. Poor old Eutychus was sitting there in the window and Paul was probably going on and on <laughs> fell out the window. Remember the story? And Paul had to rush down and prayed over him and he got up. So this was not a Sunday morning meeting, this was a evening meeting but it wasn't held on the Sabbath because the Sabbath was holy. They came together after the Sabbath. Paul had a lot to tell them. And if Sunday was so holy, why was Paul going to march the next day many, many kilometers on the so-called Holy Sunday? No, no, no. So we only have one thing still to deal with. The breaking of the bread. Let's make sure that it was in the evening. We read further in Acts 28 and 11. There were many lights in the upper chambers where they were gathered together. So it was dark, right? And it couldn't have been Sunday evening because that would have been the second day of the week, so it, they came together after the Sabbath. When he therefore came up again and had broken bread and eaten, he talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. So he even stayed longer and talked. And then when it was daylight, off he went. So it wasn't a holy day for him at all. He was going to go away, and that's the only time he had with a meeting for them. Now as for the other bit, the breaking of the bread, Acts 2.46 says, And they continued, what's it say there? Daily. Daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did they eat their meat with gladness of heart. So they didn't have a communion, they had supper together. That's what it was. So we have one text left. One text left. So in fact, this text, this preview one, previous one, supports the sanctity of the Sabbath. Because only after the Sabbath did they get together to discuss issues, and then off they went. Eighth text, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints. Ah, yes, they held church collection. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so you do. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. By, way, by the way, the Weymouth translation brings it out nicely. It says, lay by at home, as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So the critics will say, well, they held a collection during the service in church. No, no, no. The text refers to a putting aside of the money on the first day of the week at home. Now let's think about that. In the old days, like with many people that still work today, that earn their money on a weekly basis, when is payday on a weekly basis? Friday. Friday you get your pay, the work is over, you get your pay. Now you take your money and you take it home. But in the mindset of the Hebrew, Friday is the preparation. You're getting ready for the Sabbath. Paul says, put your money aside when? On the first day of the week. The logical thing is to work it all out, put aside your, your offering and your tithe and whatever you want to put aside. Paul says, no. Don't do it on the Friday when you get your money. The Sabbath is coming. The Sabbath is holy. Do it early on the first day of the week, after the Sabbath. So when the Sabbath is over, after Sunday, you go and sit down, put aside your money, so that you don't use it during the next week, and then keep it there until it can be collected. So does it help Sunday worship, or does it help Sabbath worship, this text? It's actually for Sabbath worship. The Sabbath is so holy, do it on the first day of the week. So none of those texts did it. So did Jesus change the Sabbath? Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus kept the Sabbath. Jesus said not one jot or one tittle would be removed from the law. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Jesus didn't change the Sabbath. For even hereunto we are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow him. And we should walk even as he walked, 1 John 2, 6. So Jesus kept the Sabbath. There's no evidence of a change of a Sabbath. So, where's the evidence? Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus didn't change. 
Psalms 89, 4, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing which has gone out of my lips. God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Who changed it? Catholic Church, not Jesus. If you love me, then keep my commandments. If you love them, keep their commandments. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. And He said, I know him, and, and he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's strong words. 1 John 2 verse 4. That's it. You either obey God or you don't. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 verse 3. Whosoever says that he lives in God should live just as Jesus Christ did. He kept the Sabbath. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the example. Well, the Christian world will say, the cross changed the Sabbath. No, it didn't. Let's have a look. That day was the preparation. That was Friday. The word preparation is just used for that Friday. Preparing for the Sabbath. Luke 23, 54. And the women also which came from Galilee followed, beheld the sepulcher, and laid down his body. You remember that story? And they returned, prepared spices, ointment, rested on the Sabbath. There's no change here whatsoever. According to the commandment, Luke, and they found the stone railed, rolled away again on the first day. So, the three days of the crucifixion. You have the preparation, that was Friday. You have the Sabbath. Jesus rested in the grave. They rested in on that day, the, the disciples and the women, and on the first day, things started up again. No change. No change. So neither the, the death nor the resurrection changes it. Can we really be sure which is the Sabbath day? Well, what about that one? Let's have a look what astronomy teaches us. Washington, D.C., your letter, 25 February. We had occasion to investigate the results and the work of specialists in chronology and we have never found one of them that has ever had the slightest doubt about the continuity of the weekly cycle since the beginning of the Christian era. And that is U.S. Naval Observatory, Washington, D.C. Let's have a look at this. People say we might have lost the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath was instituted there in creation. If we lost it, then it was re-established at the manor because every week the Lord made a special miracle. On that day, the manor lasted two days. Every other day it lasted one day. So the Sabbath, if it should have been lost, was reinstated over there. If it was lost thereafter, it was reinstated at Mount Sinai. Then, if we come to 46 BC, that's where the Justinian the Julian calendar at least, was instituted. So we have absolute continuity from then onwards. And the cross falls in there, and we've just read, Jesus kept the Sabbath, the disciples kept the Sabbath, and that falls in the Julian calendar. There's no loss over there. Then in 1582, there's a change of the calendar, and we move to the Gregorian calendar. Oh, that's exciting. I like that. Because the Gregorian calendar refers to whom? To Pope Gregory. And Pope Gregory saw fit to change the times. Why? Because there was something bothering him. But by the way, it didn't move the Sabbath at all. We went in October to 1, 2, 3, 4, 15 October. So we jumped a couple of days there, but the weekly cycle was not affected at all. So the Sabbath is intact. It has never been lost. By the way, why did the Pope want to move the calendar <coughs> those days? What bothered him? Why did he change the times? I'll tell you what bothered him. It bothered him that the Pash, the Christian Pash, was not 100% in line with the pagan feast of Ishtar, which we still call Easter to this day. 
And he wanted to shift the calendar those few days so that the world should keep all the pagan feasts rather than recognize what it is in the Bible. Did you know that there was war as a consequence? The British decided, no way are we going along with this. There was war as a consequence, but it was forced upon them because we will keep the pagan festivals. We will not obey the Bible. These people are very arrogant. So, no day is lost. The date shifts from the 4th to the 15th, but the weekly cycle is intact. Which day are the Jews keeping today? Saturday. Saturday. Same as always. Matthew 24, 20. Pray that your flight be not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. Jesus is saying, 70 AD, when they come to destroy this place, pray that the Sabbath day will not be the day when you have to flee. So he foresaw the Sabbath still being in existence then. One last text. Shake your heads. Go, brrr, wake up. <laughs> what about Colossians 2.16? Wow, this one is used every time. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of any holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. That's the King James Version. Let no one judge you regard to the Sabbath days. Now, Sabbath days refers to the ceremonial Sabbath days. The Sabbath day refers to the seven week days or the seven-day week Sabbath. Let no one therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a feast day or a new moon or a Sabbath day. That's the American Standard Version. All right. Which of the Ten Commandments deals with eating and drinking and new moons and all of those? Any of them? So which laws deal with eatings and drinkings and new moons and things like that. Ceremonial. The ceremonial laws. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Let no man therefore judge you. So they say, Jesus nailed the Sabbath to the cross. No. Jesus never nailed the Sabbath to the cross. He nailed two things to the cross. The whole of the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross because Jesus became the fulfillment of the law and the condemnation of the law was nailed to the cross but not the law itself. How do I know? Because it says over there that these laws, this handwriting of ordinances which was against us and only the writings of Moses, the ceremonial law were to be written in a book placed beside the ark as a witness, says the Old Testament, against us. So these were a shadow of things to come. But the body, the substance of them, is Christ. Colossians 2.17. So let's quickly recap. The weekly Sabbath was instituted in Eden, right? Okay. And it points back to creation. It existed before sin. There it is. It points to creation. Hallow my Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. It reminds us of where we come from. The shadow Sabbaths, in other words, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Passover, uh, the Feast of the Wave Offering, the First Fruits, all of those special Sabbaths. They could fall on any day, but they pointed to the ministry of Christ. They point forward to Christ. So the ceremonial Sabbath linked the sanctuary service, the shadow service, and pointed forward, forward to redemption. So when Colossians says, the Sabbath was a shadow of things to come, who did it point to? Christ. The substance thereof being Christ. So when Christ died, he nailed the ceremonial law to the cross. We don't have to keep special Sabbaths anymore. We don't have to follow the rituals of the Passover, which have to do with eating and drinking, and how much of the Passover you were supposed to have, and all those issues. It deals with ceremonies. 
But the Sabbath deals with creation and the Ten Commandments. So those are the only texts that are used against the Sabbath. The disciples, did they change the Sabbath? Paul, as his manners was, went into them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, talking to the Jews. And then it says, and he reasoned in the Sabbath with the Jews and the Greeks. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words may be preached to them the next Sabbath, and the next Sabbath day almost the whole city came together. We read that in Acts chapter 13, 42 and 44. So Paul and the disciples preached on a Sabbath. They kept the Sabbath whether they were talking to Jews or whether they were talking to Gentiles. So this is the bottom line. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep God's commandments. How many of them? Ten. All ten. And the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in my hearts. That's quoting Hebrews 18. That's the new covenant. The new covenant is taking the law of God, putting it into the heart, into the mind, onto the hand, into the forehead, act accordingly, think accordingly, obey God. The Catholic Church says no. By my divine authority you will obey me and not them. But the Bible says, Revelation 22, 14, and this is New Testament, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Aha! Obedience is going to be a test and may enter in through the gates into the city and then if you're obedient we according to his promise look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness 2 Peter 3 13 nobody now has the mark of the beast nobody now has it when that law is enforced and it's coming because the Pope has asked for it. And don't think Islamic countries or Judaic countries will be excluded. The Pope has asked for it. And they will keep it. When that law comes, then the decision will be made. And you choose either the one with the cauliflower ears and the buck teeth, or you choose the Lord. One of the two. The Bible says, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Isaiah 66, 22, 23. This is the new world. Will the Sabbath be kept in the new world? Yes or no? Yes. Well, what is this new moon thing doing over here? The new moon. From one new moon to another. So on a monthly basis, isn't the new moon festival a ceremonial law? Is that going to be kept? Well, there's something that will be kept on a monthly basis in heaven as well. Because the Bible says that the tree of life bore its fruits how many times? Once a month. So I have news for you. Oh yeah, and the Bible says it bore how many manner of fruits? Twelve kinds of fruits. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Wow! So let's imagine this. The tree of life will bear its fruit once a month. And we will go and we will partake of the tree of life once a month. The leaves, maybe we make some tea, the most delightful tea, caffeine free of course, from the tree of life. It's going to be a feast, folks. And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before the Lord, and the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Psalms 37, 29. I have condemned no one tonight, no individual. I have not said anyone is lost who is keeping Sunday out of faithfulness of their hearts at the moment. I've said none such thing. I've just said there is a system on this earth that lays claim to the fact that it stands above God, that it is higher than God, and that it has authority in your life over and above the authority of God. And that very soon this test will come to a 
point when this authority will be tested and your allegiance will be on the line and you will be asked to choose the one or to choose the other. If you choose the one, you choose the beast and you obtain its mark. If you choose the other, then you will obtain the mark or the seal of God and you will be sealed for God. That's what it is. Obedience does not lie in the day alone because the Sabbath stands for how much of the law? All of it. Because the authority of the law is based on the seal. So the Sabbath is merely the authentication of the whole law. We must develop Christ-like characters. We must allow the Lord to change us. We must have a relationship with the Lord. By keeping the law, no one's going to be saved. By having a relationship with God, we can be saved and will be saved. But if we have the right relationship with God, we will also keep His law. That's the bottom line. I hope that this issue is clear. Tomorrow night we're going to deal with the beasts of Revelation 13. And particularly the people of this nation should be here. It's thunderous stuff. Don't miss it. Thank you for coming.